Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 106, our course on interpreting scripture. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for all those who are in class today. Uh, let's pray and uh, let's get started. Father, we thank you for another day in our lives. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to come together, spend some time learning, and being equipped. And we pray, Father, for the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives, for the work of your Spirit to teach us and train us and equip us, God, so that we can be effective and we can be fruitful ministers of your kingdom here on earth. We pray for uh, an impartation of wisdom, revelation, anointing and grace on our lives as we look into your word, as we study, as we learn. Let the Holy Spirit himself be our teacher. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're continuing our journey in uh, interpreting scripture. I'll just quickly review something we touched on last week, and then we will go forward. Now, just for you, uh, the first two students, just to um, uh, reiterate, uh, no exams now. Uh, you'll have only one final exam. It'll cover everything, right? So there's no exam this week for this course, right? Uh, so you can get some rest. <laughs> All right. So. We were talking about biblical interpretation, types and shadows, and we looked at three different um, ways in which we see scripture working together. We talked about types, illustrations, and allegorizing. Right? So types are given to us in, by, in, the, in the scriptures. Right? There's something in the New Testament that looks back at the Old Testament and says like that, you know, it's pointing back to the Old Testament. And so the Old Testament, God gave it at that time to point to what was going to come, right? So it's like you see the shadow first, then you actually see the tree, right? So the shadow was in the Old Testament, we call it a type, but it was pointing to the reality. The reality was in the New Testament. So that is perfectly fine. We can use that, we can study scripture and use that to preach and teach. Then there are illustrations, which are uh, uh, something that is used like an example, you know, uh, to teach us something. So the Bible says, you know, uh, in First Corinthians 10, also in Romans 15, the Bible says, uh, things that happened to the people in the Old Testament happened as examples to us. So we can look at the stories, we can look at what is recorded in the Old Testament and look at them as illustrations or examples and learn from them, right? So example, and we've said this many times, when David went to fight Goliath, uh, we can look at his life, we can look at his courage, we can look at his boldness, we can look at that as an illustration, as an example for us, and we can be inspired. But we must not allegorize. Allegorize means we are putting into the text something that God never intended. So like we said last time, suppose we say David is like Jesus, Goliath is like Satan, and five stones represent five pieces of armor, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, uh, sword of spirit, and shield of faith, five matching. <laughs> Oh, we forgot the shoes, but anyway. <laughs> so five stones he took, five pieces of armor, and then we, you know, we make that we make it up like that. Now it sounds okay, right? And we are not doing or we are not saying anything uh, sinful, but that's an example of allegorizing. That means we are assigning a meaning to some scripture text that God never intended. We're not using it. It's not a type and a shadow. It's not, uh, it's not an illustration, but we are allegorizing. We're giving it meaning that was not there originally. That is allegorizing. That we must not do. 
right? So we'll talk more about that later. But types and illustrations are good things. So we, we must learn, we must uh, identify them in scripture and use them, all right? So we spent quite a bit of time on that last week. Today, we're going to go to the next lesson, which is on biblical interpretation or uh, on, on parables, interpreting parables. Now, before we go forward, any questions on types, illustrations, allegories? Any questions on that? Let me just check on online class if there are any. I'll just stop sharing. Any questions on the previous lesson, which is um, types, shadows, uh, Types, illustrations, allegories. Any questions on that before we get into talking about parables? Okay. Fine. So let's move on to our next lesson. Today, we'll try to cover maybe uh, at least two more lessons. Uh, we will talk about... We will talk about... First, we'll talk about parables. Let me share that. So parables... Um, we are all aware that the Lord Jesus, he used parables a lot in his preaching and teaching. Now, we do find some in the Old Testament. You know, one notable example in the Old Testament is about uh, the pro is when the prophet Nathan, he went to rebuke King David. Second Samuel, I think, chapter 11, I think. He went to rebuke King David right, because David had committed grievous crime. He had committed murder, committed adultery, all that. So the, God had sent the prophet Nathan to rebuke him. Now, how will he go rebuke? So he used a parable. Yeah? He said, King David, and he gave a story. Right? There was one man. He had sheep and all of that, but somebody came, he went and he, um, there was another poor, poor man who had just one sheep and he went and he took that person's one sheep and, you know, he did all that. So he gave the story to, he just gave the story to David. David was king. He got very angry. He said, who is that man? Come on, you know, I'll punish him. And then he said, you are that man. <laughs> you know? So... He used a parable. David understood the parable. He understood the meaning of it. He was ready to act on it. And then he, the prophet Nathan said, hey, that's what you've done. You know? And it kind of it opened David's eyes to his own wrongdoing. So that's an example in the Old Testament. But definitely, we come, now we come back to the New Testament. And we see the Lord Jesus using... A lot of parables. So what are parables? They are simply stories. Or you can say they are simply illustrations taken from everyday life. Right? Stories taken from everyday life which help us understand spiritual truth. So these are stories from everyday life. But in those stories or through those stories, we can learn some spiritual truth. Right? So, of course, the parables of Jesus had to do with stories from their time. You know, so a lot of it would be a farming, fishing, uh, those kinds of stories, things that were relevant in those days. Right? So if you think about it, and I think this question came up uh, in the class last week, is it okay for us to use stories from our life, our day-to-day -day life? Is it okay to use stories from our day-to-day -day life to help people understand spiritual truth? And the answer is yes, because that's what Jesus did. Right? He used stories from their time, which all the, the common man would easily understand. Oh, he's talking about farming. He's talking about you know, various things that they related to. You know, a shepherd carrying, taking care of sheep. Yeah. A, a woman searching for a lost coin in the house. You know, those kind of things. They all understand that. They relate to it. So if we look at it from our day and time, yes. 
we, it's good to use stories or illustrations from our everyday life in order to help people understand spiritual truth. But the important thing is the spiritual truth, right? They need to come to understand that spiritual truth. If they just listen to the story and they say, what did pastor teach me? They'll tell you the story. <laughs> Uh, they, oh, we enjoyed some nice three stories, he said. We enjoyed the stories. But if they didn't get the spiritual truth, then the stories have become a distraction, right? Uh, because they only paid attention to the story. They didn't pay attention to the truth. Right? So, so, so there is a balance to this. But understand the main purpose of the story. Right? It is in that story, Hidden, there is hidden truth. So, what are parables? Parables, uh, you know, it, it means, I mean, the literal word para is beside or alongside. So, you're throwing, like we say in English, you know, uh, you're, 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 uh, let me put it like this you're throwing two stones, right? So, along with the story, you're also passing on truth, you're throwing it together. So uh, communicating a story, but in the story, there is also truth. So you're, para, you're throwing it alongside. You're, you're, you're putting it together. Okay? You're communicating it together. The story plus truth. Right? So it's not just the story you want people to hear. You want people to understand the truth that's actually, uh, that's, that, that the story is actually pointing to. Right? So... Jesus spoke in parables, and um, you know, uh, in Matthew 13, also in Mark 4. Uh, very interesting question. Jesus, the disciples of Jesus come and ask him, Why are you speaking in parables? Why are you telling these stories? Right? So, you, you know, you can imagine they are all sitting and listening, Oh, one more story. He's already told us 10 stories, <laughs> one more story. <laughs> then next day, again, three stories. What is, the, what is going on here? Jesus is saying stories, so many stories. So they come and ask him, why are you speaking like this? Why are you speaking in these stories? You know? Then Jesus explains, right? In Matthew 13, Mark 4, he says, for you it is given. To know the mysteries of the kingdom. That means for you disciples, God has, you know, blessed you. That you are able to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. When I say it directly, you can understand it. But for the others, I have to do it like this. Right? So that means there are some people who will understand plain. Like you just tell them straight, you know, this is what the Bible, you know, the word of God says. This is, this is the truth of the kingdom. They'll understand it directly. But for some people, you need to, quote unquote, you need to package it in a story. Because he said, there's a reason why. Because the eyes of these people, they have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have hearts they cannot understand. So that is why I am putting it in a story so that at least they can get the truth. So for the disciples, he said, look, you're able to understand easily the mysteries of the kingdom because the Father has given it to you. He's, he's, helped, he's brought you into a place where you know you can understand. But for these people, it's not like that. They have eyes they can't see. They have ears they can't hear. They have hearts they can't understand. So I have to put it like this. Right? So... The parable is an attempt to help people understand the mysteries of the kingdom. Right? For those who cannot understand. Right? It's, it's like I'm doing taking one more step. Other people, if I speak directly to the disciples, if I speak directly, they will understand. But these people, they cannot. So I have to put, take one more step. I have to put it in a story. And then hopefully they will understand through the story. You know, they'll go and think, ah, he said like this, he said like that. Maybe they're thinking about the story. 
what is so great in that story? Yeah, we are doing this every day. Every day we are going to the farm. Every day we are going to the field and putting seed. And what is so great? Oh, oh, maybe the seed means something. Oh, maybe it means it is God's word. You know. So as they think about the story, they will stumble upon the truth. Maybe. So it's an attempt to help people understand the truth. So that's why Jesus spoke in parables. And it's perfectly fine if we do something similar. So parables were an effective form of uh, communication. They got the attention of the hearers. Uh, it in, they encouraged people to think about it. You know, you think about the story, yeah. And uh, it then would lead them to the truth. So if you look at the parables... Uh, the stories Jesus used, there's so many, right? So we just listed some of them here, you know, about the two houses, one house built on the rock, one house built on the sand. So very, very simple. They can all understand it. Yeah, if you build a house on the rock, it will be safe when the storm comes. If you build a house on the sand, it's going to collapse, no foundation. But then Jesus said, whoever hears my words, and does these things does my whoever hears and hears and does my word he is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock so the story was very simple very easy to understand but the main meaning is you must listen to my word and you must live by my word then you will be like this strong stable Storms will come, rains will come, floods will come, but you will be standing, right? So it, it put, put it in a very simple way, but a very powerful truth was communicated. So like that, you know, there are many stories. Um, we are familiar, uh, you know, as you've read, read through the Gospels, uh, you would have gone through these parables. So I'm not going through all of them. But the question is, or the main thing we want to learn is, how do we interpret the parables? Interpreting parables, we must interpret them correctly to get the correct meaning out of the parables. right? Um, because sometimes we can take a parable and preach something totally different that Jesus never meant. And these Jesus will be looking down from heaven. Hey, that's not what I meant. You know? I can imagine Jesus <laughs> like, oh, no. What does this guy say? You know? And uh, he, you know, Jesus must be like, Gabriel, you need to go do something. You know, <laughs> go tell this guy not to interpret my parable like that. You know, uh, I can just imagine. You know, because we read the parable and we, we say something else that Jesus did not even mean. And uh, okay, so you know, uh, we need to interpret these parables correctly. How do you do it? Well. Here are just some guidelines. Number one, understand the story's natural meaning. Yeah. This was the actual story that he was saying. You know? So understand what he was saying. This is literal. Take it literal. All, you know, this is what he's saying. A shepherd had 100 sheep. One sheep got lost. Right? Or a woman, she lost a coin. You know. Yeah, okay, you understand. Very simple. Don't, don't make it complicated. Understand the story. Simple stories. Then, see in what, was the, in what context did Jesus use that parable or that story or that illustration? In what context was he doing it? Sometimes he's responding to a question. Sometimes there's a request from people to explain something. Uh, sometimes, you know, somebody's made a complaint, said, how many times must I forgive my brother? He's very irritated. <laughs> How many times? He's waiting for a number. Yeah, and, and then Jesus talks about the story about um, you know, how the king forgave the man who owed a huge debt. But that man didn't go and forgive his servant who owed him a small amount. He didn't do that. And so then, the, so he start, he's teaching about forgiveness through that story, right? Saying, so see, basically, 
God has forgiven us so much that we need to turn around and forgive people who may have offended us. But what they've done to us is nothing in comparison to what we've done against God himself. Right? And then he says, okay, seven times 70. So does it mean you count them? 400, yeah, 490 times. Well, you've reached, coming close, 487. <laughs> Three more times finished. I can take revenge. No, that's not the point. He's not talking about little numbers, seven times 70. He's basically saying, it's just as how much, you know, how immeasurably, without measure, God has forgiven us. Right? That way we have to forgive others. Right? So that's the point of those stories, right? So, so it's maybe, you know, um, so when you understand the context, uh, it'll help us understand, uh, interpret the story correctly. Uh, parables sometimes were given with a stated purpose. So Jesus, he says, okay, I want to, you know, this is how it is. Yeah. And he gives a parable. There are parables of the kingdom, meaning he's specifically saying, this is how the kingdom of God operates. Right? So for example, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. There was a man, who, owner of a vineyard, and he needed some laborers to work in his vineyard. So nine o'clock in the morning, he goes to the city center. He sees some laborers there. He says, hey, you're looking for work? I'm just paraphrasing it, right? but you're looking for work? Okay, go work in my vineyard. I'll give you the day's wages. Okay. So some people go nine o'clock in the morning, they start working. And he needs more laborers. So 12 o'clock in the afternoon, he goes to the city centers. There he finds some people looking for work. Hey, go work in my vineyard. 12 o'clock. Three o'clock. Some he needs some more workers. Hey, you find some people, go work in my vineyard. So there are people, some started working at nine o'clock in the morning, some started working at 12, some started working at three. Now at six o'clock in the evening, end of the day, they all line up. So the people who started working at nine, they are waiting. Oh, today I will get 1,000 rupees. Just making up. Uh, that person, he started at half a day, he should get 500. That person started at three o'clock, he should get 250. But the master comes, gives everybody 1,000. So these people are, hey, how much you got? 1,000. You also got 1,000. <laughs> but you started only at 12 o'clock. Three o'clock law. How much you got? Thousand. You got thousand. Hey, I started at nine o'clock. You started at three o'clock. This is not fair. So they start complaining. Then the master responds. He says, hey, two things. First, I gave you what I agreed. Nine o'clock, you agreed for thousand rupees. I gave you thousand rupees. Why are you complaining? Second, master says, don't I have a right to do as I wish with what I have? Right? Don't I have a right to do as I wish with what I have? It's his money, not the, their money. If he wants to give 1,000 to the person who started, I'm putting it in simple <laughs> terms. Right? If he wants to give 1,000 rupees to the person who started at 3 o'clock, that is his, his wish. Can I not do as I wish? And then Jesus says, so is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like this. So what is he trying to get? What is the message he's trying to get to us through that story? He says, many, uh, the first shall be last. The last shall be first, he says. So what is the message he's getting to us? There's several things we can take. First, that we must not judge other people. You know, God will call people at different points in time into work in his vineyard. He calls them. And it's up to God whom he calls and whom he chooses and how he uses them and how he blesses them. It's entirely up to God. I cannot point a finger and say, hey, that 
man, that woman, they don't deserve this. No. It is entirely up to God. And whom he calls, whom he chooses, how he uses them, how he blesses them. Right? I, as a person, as a part of the kingdom, I must just recognize that. I can't go and keep judging and saying, hey, that person should not have such a big church. That should not that person should not have such a big ministry. What what he's doing? What no, no, that is not my business. That, that is this is God's kingdom. It's entirely up to God. Now, whom he calls, whom he chooses, how he uses them, how he blesses them. That's entirely up to God. Right? And I must learn to rejoice in however God blesses them. You know, imagine the person who came at nine o'clock, he got thousand rupees. The person who came at three o'clock got thousand. You also got thousand. Wonderful, man. You're really blessed. <laughs> That's a different attitude. Like, hey, I'm happy you got that. I got what I what he told me I will get, I got. I agreed for thousand, he gave me thousand. Now you came at three o'clock, you also got thousand. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Let us rejoice. Be happy. Right? Why complain? Right? Anyway, we got the same amount. It's fine. Yeah. So you're happy. You're celebrating how God blesses, calls, anoints, and uses people. That's fine. Right? Now, how does this translate into everyday life? Example, suppose you've been working in a city. You've been working 40 years in that city, pastoring. After 40 years of working, you have a church, 500 people. Now one fellow graduates from APC Bible College. He comes to the same city. In two years, he's got 500 people. God, I work here 40 years. After 40 years, I have church of 500. That bacha. <laughs> Just two years he graduated. Little boy. God, you're you're how how he must be doing something wrong. <laughs> how he's got church of 40 people. See, that is how we tend to think. But that is not kingdom thinking. Because according to this parable, who am I to judge? God will call, God will choose, and God himself will use, God will anoint, God will bless as he pleases. And I, I can't judge. What, what God has called us, each one of us to do is to be faithful in what he's given you. You be faithful. You got, you got, to, got the message, right? So, but that parable, that simple parable, that Jesus gave, if you think about it and we understand it and we try to draw the principle, what is the truth about the kingdom that he is saying, then that that is you know that that will teach us a lot. But suppose we use this parable and say, Oh, God is a partial God. The people he chose at nine o'clock were the Jews, the people he chose at twelve o'clock. But the Baptists and the people he chose at three o'clock are the Pentecostals. If I interpret like that, it is it correct? It's not correct. That is not what Jesus meant. It's not what he meant, right? I am assigning some meaning to that parable and making God look like he has favorites. No, he he treats those that group of people. Better than these. No, no, no. That is not what he meant. Right? He has no favorites. God is not a partial God. God is fair and just to everybody. Right? But he's helping us understand something about the kingdom, some a principle of the kingdom that should operate in our lives. He's not trying to tell us that God is a partial God or he has some favorite groups of people. None of that. And so if somebody interprets that parable and starts saying things like this, I've just made up an example, but 
if they say, oh, this group, nine o'clock group is this, and 12 o'clock group is this, and three o'clock group is this, and then that is a wrong interpretation of that parable. You understood, right? All looking at me very strange. <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope you understood. All right. Number three. Uh, so, which is what we did. Determine the main truth be, being illustrated by the parable. Do not turn parables into allegories by trying to read meaning into every detail. Right? So, don't allegorize it. Like example, I said, no, don't say 9 o'clock group is this, 12 o'clock group is this. That, Jesus never said that. He never meant it. And don't read meaning into every detail. No. You try to get the essence of it, but don't go and say, oh, every detail, this represents that, and this represents that, and this represents that. Because Jesus, if, if Jesus wanted to, us to do that, he would have explained that to us. Right? But don't allegorize every detail. You know, for example, I think we'll give some examples, right? We'll, we'll, we'll explain this. Uh, use only those analogies that were explicitly pointed out. Use only that which Jesus pointed out right? in the story, in the illustration, in the parable. If he pointed out all whoever was giving that story, what was pointed out, use only that. Very important. Number five, validate the main truth of the parable with the teaching of the rest of Scripture. That means whatever truth I draw out of the parable must be consistent with the teaching of the rest of Scripture. I can't use one parable and come out with some meaning that is not supported by the rest of Scripture. For example, I've I heard one, you know, one famous preacher. Um, I, uh, this is in Luke 15, I, I, and I just point this out because I, I want to just give us a bad example, an example of how you must not interpret scripture. So, if you turn with me to Luke 17, I'll just give an example. And this was actually like a very famous person. Uh, I won't mention his name and all that, but so this was based on Luke 17. Um, if you look from verse 5 to 10, Luke 17, 5 to 10. This is an example of how we shouldn't assign some meaning that was not intended in the parable. All right? So, you know, in Luke 17, 5, um, the apostles come to the Lord Jesus and they say, Lord, increase our faith. To that, Jesus responded. If you have faith like a mustard seed, you can say to the tree, mulberry tree, be pulled up by the root, be planted in the sea, and it obey you. Then, right after that, the scripture is continuing. Okay, there's a text. The text of the scripture continues. And which of you, having a servant who is plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I've eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he, hid, because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, you say we are unprofitable servants, we have done what was our duty to do. So we read Luke 17, 5 to 10. Now, this was what that preacher said. He said, faith is like a servant. When you release your faith, faith goes out on your field. It does work for you. And then it comes back. And then uh, you don't have to thank, you know, you don't have to thank your servant. The servant just did what he was supposed to do. 
that was the message he preached. Everybody shouted, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, and all that. My question is, is that the correct interpretation of Luke 17, 5 to 10? Is that what Jesus was saying? Was he saying, faith is your servant that you send out into the field? What do you think? So there are two separate thoughts, right? See, remember, the Bible was not written in chapter and verse. The, the writers wrote whatever the Holy Spirit brought to their remembrance at that time. So there are actually two separate thoughts. Here, there is verses 5 and 6. So if you actually look at it, verses 1 to 5 is about forgiveness. Luke 17, 1 to 5. Verses 5 and 6 is about faith. And verses 7 to 10 is about serving God. Right? So you don't mix up the thoughts. Right? The, the question in 5 and 6 was about faith. Increase our faith. And then the Lord said, okay. This is how you use your faith. You have to speak in faith. It'll happen. Then he continued to talk to them about serving God. Before verse 5, he was talking about forgiving people. Now, two verses talking about faith. Then talking about our attitude in serving God. That even after we have gone out, We've done, when we come back, we say, Lord, I've only done what you've told me to do. Right? It's not like I've got done you a favor. Right? I've only done what you have told me to do. Right? And, and God knows how to reward us and honor us and so on. But that's just an example where there's an illustration there about telling the tree to move. And there's another illustration about a servant serving his master and how the master relates to the servant there's illustration there that's illustrated so don't mix that illustration with something else in front you'll get some you know, some totally different meaning okay sean your question Yeah, if, if there is a common thread, then you recognize it and use it. But if there is not, then we shouldn't. We should treat them as separate stories. Because remember, Jesus could have actually said these stories on different occasions. But the writer, gospel writers, were writing it one after the other. So Jesus could have on one day said one story. Maybe on another day he would have said another story. But for our in the gospel it may have been put in the same chapter it doesn't mean he was saying it in all in the same sermon right because this was they were writing what the holy spirit was bringing to their remembrance they were not putting the date and time okay on july 4th nine o'clock service he preached this <laughs> july 10th nine ten o'clock service he preached that no they're just putting it as the Holy Spirit reminded them, right? So when we read, we get the impression as though it was all part of one sermon. May not, it could have been, but it may not have been, right? So we have to treat them separately. If there is a common thread, in example, Mark 4, or the Sermon on the Mount, yeah, that was one sermon that goes across several chapters, five, six, seven, one sermon. But it goes across three chapters. So yeah, then you treat them. But even in that three chapters, they're all different, different thoughts, various kinds of thoughts. He's talking about different things, you see. So you treat them all in separation. If there's a common thread, okay, then you connect. Right? So to interpret carefully. So 
let me just finish this. We'll take up some questions from online students as well. So when you're studying a parable, and you say, oh, how was it introduced? Who were those hearers? What is the action commanded or the response expected from the parable, from that story? Okay. So let me see if there are any questions from our online class. Any questions, online students? You've been following this. Any questions? Okay, so um, the par some of the parables of Jesus, the stories that he used, are so powerful. That of uh, the prodigal son. Such a simple story, but a very, very powerful story. Right? That is capturing to us how we have gone away from God. We've done all kinds of wrong things. And then how when we return to God, repent and return to God, he, he still receives us. Now recently I heard somebody interpret one part of the parable. They said it like this. You know, they said, hey, you see? You have to go and ask your father to give you your inheritance, your share of the inheritance. It's in the Bible. And they were actually referring to the story of the prodigal son. Now, is that a right application of that story? Is that what Jesus wants people to do? Just because the prodigal did that, or the elder brother was there, uh, no, that's not, that's not the purpose of the story. Right? So there was some family matter, family issue, family matter issue. And that person is quoting this parable, this prodigal son story. See, so the younger son went and asked the father for his inheritance. Father gave it to him. You go ask. But that is not what Jesus intended from the story. That's a misuse of the parable, right? The purpose of that parable was to talk to us about the love of God, of, of what sin has done for us, and how we need to return to God, and what how God would welcome us. Right? That's the purpose. Uh, and so we should not, you know, we should not allegorize that parable. We will come to allegorizing next thing. So, so sometimes um, people can say, well, the prodigal son represents this kind of people, and the eldest son represents these kind of people in the church and uh, all of that. Uh, well, we can say that we should not have the attitude of the eldest son. That's the a right application. But don't use that, the, the eldest son, as a representation of this kind of group of people and the prodigal son, like this kind of group of people. All the youth are represented by the prodigal. All the older people are represented by the elder son. Don't use those kinds of things. Right? Sometimes people do all that, you know. But that is not what Jesus intended. So don't don't allegorize that parable. It can lead into you know all kinds of wrong uh, misapplication, misunderstanding of that. Okay. Any questions? Yes, Sean. Yeah, so first, so Sean is talking about the Lord being anointed. So first, we would not call it a parable. Yeah, because it is an incident. It actually happened. Parable is a story that didn't have, or, you know, it's an illustration uh, from everyday life. But in this case, it was an actual incident. So what we find when you compare the gospel narratives is Jesus was anointed on two different occasions. In one, it is clearly given who anointed him. One is, uh, I think, in John 12, where Mary, 
Mary and Martha. So Mary, she anoints Jesus. And you can see that the number of days before his, if you read the passages carefully, you'll find the number of days were different. So one, I think, was six days before his crucifixion. One was three days before his crucifixion. So the day that you can see the difference in the timing, you'll also see the difference in who did it. One was done by Mary, uh, and uh, uh, and the other was done was done by this unnamed woman who came. You'll also see the difference in the location. One was done in the house of uh, Simon, uh, uh, and uh, the other was done, I think, in Mary's house or something, something like that. So you'll find. So the, basically, you can, if you look at those passages very carefully, you'll conclude that it's easy to conclude actually that. These are two separate occasions where uh, two different women came and uh, they anointed. You know, and one broke the alabaster box on his head, the other wiped his feet with the, with the tears. So how they did it also is very different. So it's, we can conclude that these were two separate uh, uh, incidents. Yeah. They have cross reference it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so some Bibles have these headings and cross references. That is fine. The cross reference doesn't necessarily mean it is the same thing. They're saying, okay, here's another incident that's similar to this, right? Or they may, if they cross reference verses, uh, it doesn't. It means that that verse has some relation to it, but doesn't mean it's exactly the same. So, so when they cross reference across the Gospels, they're just saying, okay, here's another incident that's like this, where Jesus was anointed. Uh, you know, similar, similar incident. So, so the cross reference helps in our study of the scriptures. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a break. When we come after the break, we're going to talk about avoiding allegorizing, and then hopefully we'll also get into how to interpret prophetic scriptures, right? Uh, so the prophetic passage in scripture, how do we go about interpreting them, right? So we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you.